Welcome everyone. Thank you for all coming out on this frig frigid day. Um, today is going to be a really special treat and I know you all know that. That's why you're all here. Um, so uh, this is the March edition of our 2017 Sunday Salons and I have to thank profoundly David and Laura Gray for sponsoring this whole Sunday Salon series this year and making it possible. Um, so um, coming up in April, we're going to have a speaker who will talk about Thomas Cole in Italy, which is where Thomas Cole was happiest and most productive in his life. And I think after that lecture, we're all going to be itching to get on a plane and go. So uh, please come back for that one. And then on April 30th, we're going to open up our new season with, in this room, an exhibition on Sanford Gifford. And in the main house, the Parlors Project, which you will be hearing a lot about from Jean and Matthew. So we will have two speakers today, and I will um, introduce them in turn. So the first is Matthew Mosca. And this man is known all over the world as the go-to guy for paint analysis and paint expertise. Um, it, he is, has over 30 years of experience, uh, the nationally recognized consultant in the field of historic paint research and restoration. Um, and I think what's incredibly magical about what this man can do is that he can take a tiny piece of paint from the wall and figure out un in his lab and the microscope and all kinds of methods that seem like, it's like sorcerer's work, figure out all of the ingredients and the pigments and the, the layers that go into that, a hundred, couple hundred years of layers in that little piece, it's just extraordinary. Uh, and we're so fortunate that he has spent his time here because he discovered the decorative painting on the walls. So we are thrilled. And then we will have uh, Jean Dunbar up next and I'll introduce her after that. And then we'll have questions after they have both spoken because I think a lot of questions should be probably addressed to both of them after their, after their talks. So first, please welcome Matthew Mosca. Thank you, Betsy, for that nice introduction. Um, the project at Cedar Grove was uh, quite an interesting challenge because unlike so many historic houses where the first finish period is the most important one, the one that, go that you're going to restore because it was the uh, finishes that were consistent with the construction of the house and reflect the builder's ideas. Here at Cedar Grove, we're really not that interested in the first finish. We're interested in the time that Thomas Cole was here, which began in 1836 until his death in 1848. So it's primarily the second finish that we were looking at. Um, the um, floor plan of the house, the, the rooms that we're principally going to be looking at this, this afternoon will be the entry hall, the west parlor, the, that little pantry room, which though it's small, turned out to be extremely important, and the east room. And the, certainly the west parlor, the east room, and the entry hall, would have been the more public spaces in the house, and ones, ones where Cole was likely to have shown his artwork to potential clients in a domestic setting that would reflect sophisticated taste of the time. Now, <clears throat> happily, the project was divided into two separate phases because I found that uh, after being here for a week collecting paint samples, I really needed to look at those samples. And what happened is that I had many more questions after doing the initial analysis than I had answers. So I came back for a, a second week. And here we are in the entry hall. Uh, and I began in this room with um, just initial exposures, scraping, and so forth. And you can see the, um, the plaster surface is not white. That is not a, um, a fine white finish plaster, but rather a plaster that contains a great deal of sand. And when you find that in a house of the date of Cedar Grove, it's a very strong indication that the builder intended to use wallpaper 
because wallpaper on this type of relatively inexpensive plaster was a great deal less expensive than doing the white finish coat plaster and painting. So naturally then as now everybody wants to cut a few corners and uh, nobody's construction project ever comes in under budget so uh, no doubt Mr. Thompson thought of using wallpaper which was also very fashionable uh, directly on the plaster. And uh, examination of the plaster also showed that there were remnants of glue, which you can kind of see this brownish uh, material there that was applied in order to hold the wallpaper in place. Now the other thing I'd like to point out is this uh, light red color labeled F here. And uh, looking at it, that's the first finish, paint finish, that's on the plaster. And I thought, well, you know, in terms of color, that would not be too uncharacteristic of the period of the 1830s when coal came to the site. But the way the paint was made made me very suspicious. It was extremely finely ground and uh, even distribution of the pigment particles that looked a lot more like early 20th century paint than early 19th century paint. And um, as it turns out, Florence Cole Vincent, a descendant of Thomas Cole, when she got control of the house, uh, had a major renovation done. And she obviously had very good painters who scraped the daylights out of all the walls and uh, washed them down. So a lot of information uh, predating the early 20th century was lost in the process. Now this is a cross section of a paint sample and plaster from the uh, East Room. And what I wanted to point out to you is the characteristic of the plaster with the sand particles. These are the sand particles in there. And how different that is from white finished plaster. You can also see the glue layer right on top of the, of the plaster. Um, in this room, and actually in the uh, entry hall, it turned out uh, that water-soluble paint was used, called distemper paint. Uh, and it was a system that was very easy to do. You could apply it directly to the plaster before the plaster was fully cured. You didn't have to wait a long time for the plaster to cure and complete your decoration. And then maybe in five or 10 years, you would wash that off and, and redo it. Well, I found some very interesting samples in the entry hall uh, right above the door frame. These are good areas to look when you're looking for these removable paints. The reason being is that people will wash, when they wash the, the, the wall, they'll be you know scrubbing it off, but they don't go down to the edges so much. And so I was able to find some very interesting uh, paint samples here including a distemper paint made with French ultramarine blue, which is what you're seeing here. The ultramarine blue is the, these deep pigment particles. And uh, when I mentioned this to Jean, she told me that uh, Cole was very fond of that uh, color, was known to have used it, and that this probably indicated his uh, paint application in the entry hall. French ultramarine blue uh, was only about 10 years old when Cole married into the family here at, at Cedar Grove. It was found by a French chemist in 1826 and became immensely popular thereafter because <clears throat> blue pigments were always extremely expensive and this one while it was still expensive enough to be a um, status symbol to use reduced the the price considerably and made it much more possible for more middle class people to use this color in their homes but i had only found one small bit of this blue pigment, and I thought, gee, you know, 
I really want confirmation that this was used. So um, after discussing it with uh, Betsy and Jean, we set it up that I would come back and collect more samples and do additional investigation. And happily, in the entry hall above the front door frame, I found a lot of the uh, French ultramarine blue paint. Oh. Here, gave it away. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but there it is. This is Cole's paint application here. And here is that light red finish from Florence, so it's considerably later in date. And there you have the restored room. And interestingly, we, we were talking about this, this blue color you will see at times in the shading and the shadows on the mountains. At certain times of the day, there's this slightly purplish blue shadow that's cast on the mountains. Uh, I'm sure cold, uh, reference that too. Well, during the second phase, uh, Jean asked me to look at what we all thought was a wallpaper border in the pantry, that little room there. And uh, I, when I, I had stuck my head in the door at the, during the first visit and thought, oh, this is very interesting, but it was outside of of the um, scope of the work, and I had a lot to accomplish, so I didn't really spend much time in here. And I thought, wow, for a pantry, using this type of uh, very Greek, very grand color scheme would kind of be curious. Why would you do that? Uh, so Jean said, well, get up on a ladder and look at it. So as soon as I got on the ladder, I realized it's not wallpaper, it's paint. And indeed, since we knew that Cole had a history in decorative painting, this could very well have been done by Thomas Cole. And all of the um, conclusions that we had drawn, that I had drawn in particular after my first visit, now had to be completely looked at anew. <laughs> That was truly my reaction. <laughs> because when you find something like that in a small room, you have to look for similar decorations in the principal rooms. And uh, this is in the West Parlor, my initial uh, exposures. This is on an outside wall. Sure enough, there was some sort of frieze ornament in that room as well. So this room would not have been wallpapered during Cole's era, but we're finding paint that relates to Cole's period. Uh, this particular location proved to be quite damaged. So during the second phase, I started working on the interior wall, the east wall of the West Parlor. And here you can see the, the condition of the uh, coal decoration. Not terribly good in, in the, this location. But you can, you can start to see this design coming up of uh, some sort of chevron-like uh, bands with decorations within them. You can kind of see the, the squiggles in here and there. And then these dots and the large, maybe, seed pods, I don't know. And then more lines that go up here. This room had a, a dropped ceiling, a ceiling that had been dropped about four inches, and the decoration passed up behind the dropped ceiling. So there would be another uh, mystery that would have to be solved. Now, we were immensely lucky in that um, Margaret Selisky, uh, a painting conservator and objects conservator who lives in this area was available to take on the task of doing major uncovering of the decoration. And this is after she has done some work uh, in the West Parlor. The 
<clears throat> drop ceiling has been removed, and as you can see, Margaret is finding more and more of this um, very interesting and inventive decoration. And here, here's a section of it after Margaret has done some in painting so that the losses have been replaced. And it's almost as if it's like folded paper or fabric that's been folded below and then this remarkable dental pattern. This is of course all flat, you know, it's done in trompe l'oeil effect. And I'm even beginning to wonder if Cole wanted us to think that these are moldings that step out from the wall and cast shadows. So that just amazing inventive uh, design, which Gene will be showing where he got these ins the inspiration for these things. There's more of it coming up. And, and again, you can see the alternation of light and dark in the decoration. And this is with the, uh, the primer, which was tinted to look like the original wall color, the wall color that goes with this uh, decoration, sort of a soft mauve. And it, too, had French ultramarine blue pigment in the mix. Now, the East Parlor was even more mysterious, <laughs> if, any, if possible. Uh, here, too, uh, decoration is coming up with a Greek key-type design at the top, and then these bands again, and here are some vertical bands, and I don't, at this point, I had no idea what this was. And then what looked like swags of fabric, but we were totally mystified by what all of this was. And as a matter of fact, we went off on this wild tangent, thinking because Cole became quite religious later on in his life, that this might have been um, a euphorbia, which is the plant that was the crown of thorns. And it has a flower that's not unlike uh, this here. So, well, you know, we were getting ourselves tied up in knots <laughs> thinking about the, what this was. Well, again, Margaret solved the problem. Uh, I had, she and I talked and we discussed what I had used to remove the paint and what she was planning on using and we came up with a very good uh, system for the removal of the overpaint and um, there she has it. She, this is a, a gel material that she used. She's timed how long it needs to be on the surface so that it doesn't work too long and damage the actual coal period. And, um, and then she would remove it with cotton swabs. Here's more of, of that technique, removing some of the uh, earlier layers. And finally, there's the design coming up. Those were not flower forms at all, but a knotted fringe dangling from these uh, swags of fabric that pass through rings. And here's Margaret working on the wall. And there it, there it is again. It completely transformed the room. And again, those black uh, bands, I'm, I'm thinking, it, uh, is also the idea of creating a shadow so that the, um, the Greek key section would be seen as projecting from the wall. Oh, oh that's it. So... Jean is going to fill in all the holes that I left. So. <laughs> well, you left us on the edge of our seats here. <laughs> well, to complete this amazing story, we have Jean Dunbar. And she has been the leader of this decade-long project to figure out what these rooms originally looked like and were used for. Because unlike a lot of historic homes, 
historic house museums that work from a photograph, there was no photograph from when Thomas Cole was there. So how do we find out? Well, Jean digs into the archives of history and pulls out these little details, and she can piece them together because of her knowledge of the materials and methods and the prices of things on lists, and she can deduce exactly what was there. And um, she has a PhD from the University of Virginia, and she's worked on some of the most extraordinary projects in the country. Um, and our, we call her the forensic decorator. <laughs> she can find stuff out. Um, so uh, we're just thrilled to have her on this. She's been leading us through uh, with one discovery after the next. And um, I think she's um, drunk the Kool-Aid, as we call it. She's as excited as we are about, <laughs> we, we sometimes call it the coal aid. <laughs> so please welcome Jean Dunbar. Let me just dispense with this. Well, it's just, it's lovely to look out and see a lot of unfamiliar faces and also some people who were here when this began and some people who were here before it began and inspired it. Um, I think Matthew and I are in total agreement that we're very glad that this project didn't proceed too rapidly because if it had, we would have made major, major mistakes along the way, um, like those thorns and actually worse than that. So we had plenty of time, plenty of time to think. Um, the story of the decoration of Cedar Grove actually begins um, I think I need to go back here. I think we're missing one. Hmm, something isn't right here. Uh, these are not where we should be. We're at the end instead of the beginning. Is there a way we can, can backtrack that? Yeah, thanks. Not as if there is an end. There is a beginning to this project, but there appears to be no end. <laughs> and actually, when I thought of my clever little part two thing, I thought, yeah, designing for life. Boy, here we go. Um, the story of the decoration really begins with one central event, and that is um, the marriage of Thomas Cole to Mariah Bartow in November of 1836. Um, the certificate of marriage, which has been, for reasons I cannot figure out, uh, chopped off here so that you can't read it, um, actually says that it's a marriage between uh, Thomas Cole, a uh, member of the Academy of Design, and Mariah Bartow, gentlewoman. Um, what is truly remarkable, though, is that less than two years after the marriage, Cole was already embroiled in completely redoing the interior decoration of a house that he didn't own and never would. Um, we know this because in um, the records we can find that he actually, during his stay um, in New York, uh, purchased a carpet for the West Parlor, which suggests that he had already done a lot of other things there um, before. November of 1838. Um, as Matthew mentioned, the principal rooms um, that were sort of Thompson family territory that Cole took over and redecorated are the two parlors, the entry hall, and the pantry, which I think we probably at this point should rename uh, since it seems to have served another purpose. But we're left with some really um, interesting pressing questions. First of all, why on earth did Alexander Thompson allow a brand new son-in-law to do over his house. You don't usually say, ah, I see you're married, please redecorate. <laughs> Second, why did a highly successful American artist turn his hand to decorating, when we're accustomed to thinking of artists as making great efforts to set themselves aside from decoration? And um, what did Thomas Cole choose to do to Cedar Grove, and why? Um, one of the things that no doubt influenced the family that Cole moved into in, in their decision to let him redecorate was that they had knowledge of his early life, which we either don't have or had largely forgotten. 
Um, Cole was born in Bolton, the Moors of uh, Lancashire, but he actually was moved with his family to a nearby town called Chorley. Um, we're not sure exactly when, but it was sometime roughly around the time that Cole had an abortive uh, attempt at boarding school. He was sent to a boarding school that turned out to be brutal and cruel and horrible. And his parents, who clearly loved him very much, brought him home and said, forget school, um, we need to do something else. His father wanted him to take an apprenticeship in a profession of some sort, law, something like that, and not follow him into the textile industry. The, his father was a Muslim man manufacturer. But um, Chorley was actually uh, a town that was very famous for a particular role in uh, the cotton industry in Lancashire. And it was a role that really fit with a particular talent that Cole had already demonstrated. Um, from the time that he was very little, apparently, he uh, liked to make drawings. And one of his major occupations was copying landscapes from um, cups and saucers and plates. Um, and after much discussion with his father, the decision was made to apprentice him um, in the English cotton industry, um, but not um, I'm really not sure why these slides are displaying very oddly here, but they are. Um, the one on the left is actually an example of dress goods, um, relatively small-scale prints that were used for apparel. There's some overlap between these two types, but they are mostly distinct. And then on the right is what's called a furniture, which is a much more elaborate, highly designed um, print that's intended to be used uh, in home decoration for curtains, drapery, upholstery, loose covers, things like that. Um, Cole's apprenticeship was to be um, in Chorley with uh, a printer who specialized in furnitures. Oops. Um, and in entering the industry when he did, um, and, and we're talking here about the age of 10, or perhaps 11, when he entered this program, he was going to work in an industry that was probably the English equivalent of our Silicon Valley. It was a huge uh, power center and, and financial generator, um, one of the biggest in the, in the British Isles. It also ran heavily on child labor. So uh, in Chorley, at the time that Cole apprenticed, there were approximately 1,200 men who worked in the, the print works in Chorley. There were countless, countless children and women. Um, we'll never know how many because records were never kept of them. They worked six hours, uh, they worked six days a week, uh, 12 hours a day, um, and didn't attend school for obvious reasons. So the decision um, to apprentice Cole uh, in this kind of a print works would have been uh, desperate if his destiny had been to learn to uh, print um, designs with, with blocks and plates, as we see on the left, um, or to assist with the later finishing of designs, or to do the sort of thing that you see in the lower right, which is called penciling, where they actually put in colors by hand using a, using a brush. Um, uh, this would have been a terrible fate, but actually, uh, his career objective was to become a designer of furnitures. So, um, and as you can see, they're absolutely remarkable. They're astonishing works of art in and of themselves. This is just a small sample of the kinds of things that were being produced in Lancashire at the time. Um, as a result of the training that Cole would receive to learn uh, to, to print and uh, design, he became very, very, very conversant with fashionable printed fabrics. Um, and those uh, ideas were immediately put to work in Cedar Grove. Uh, the, the border there from the west parlor makes total sense if you see it in combination with these Lancashire prints, which are what is called indigo resist, um, prints that are made with, with indigo dye. And Cole knew those prints intimately, and he was able to simulate them uh, very nicely in the west parlor. Um, in the course of his training, he learned to uh, transfer drawings to blocks and plates, to carve and to etch. 
And um, thanks to some um, analogies and technology, he actually accidentally um, acquired, without intending it, a second trade. Um, the illustration on the left shows calico printing. The illustration on the right shows wallpaper printing. If you can't tell the difference between the two, you're right on the mark. <laughs> it was absolutely the same technology. And that would prove to be enormously helpful for Cole and for his family when they emigrated at the end of his apprenticeship in 1818. They came first to Pennsylvania and then moved to Steubenville, where Cole and his father uh, set up a wallpaper printing business next to a paper mill. A large part of what Cole learned as a designer in the UK was industrial espionage. Uh, how to copy designs created by other people, how to obtain designs created by other people and copy them. Um, and that technique served him in very good stead when he got to America and started printing wallpaper. Um, the one real kind of document that we have about the products that he and his father produced indicate that they were producing very high style wallpaper. Um, I feel certain they were doing that uh, out of Cole's memory bank of usable patterns. The, um, on the diagonal here, the three uh, patterns that you see are all wallpaper patterns of the period. And of course, the one on the upper right is Cole's rendition of a wallpaper design. Uh, from that period. This sets him completely apart from most other decorative painters of the era. There are other painted houses in America in the 1830s and 40s, but they're of an entirely different caliber and order of magnitude. Um, by and large, they are done by itinerant painters, and very, very frequently, as in this new project of Matthews, um, they're stenciled. So on the left is the stenciling uh, work of an American decorative painter. On the right is the almost entirely freehand decoration by Thomas Cole. And we thank Margaret Selisky for getting close enough uh, to the paint to let us know that. Both of these are swags of fabric with a pattern border. Both of them have knotted fringe, but they really come from two absolutely different worlds. Cole's um, training also taught him, and he said this in his memories of his time in the, in the cotton business, that he had started out copying, but he had eventually learned to create new designs. The West Parlor is really a pretty good example of that. You can see other, uh, well, in this case, wallpapers that are uh, of the same era and also present fabrics that are folded, slightly draped, but none of them is really like the West Parlor precisely. It's definitely a new design. And that kind of originality is very, very important to the discoveries that we've made here at Cedar Grove. As a result of his time in both of these industries, um, Cole had a remarkably developed and astute sense of fashion trends and tastes and of how to suit them. So the, the color scheme on the left from the West Parlor, and we'll talk a little bit about that carpet that you see part of there in the lower left, that coloring to us seems lovely, unusual, strange, original, but if you look at the fabrics from the 1830s on the right-hand side, you'll see that Cole was speaking the color language of fashion and doing it very adeptly. Uh, similarly, in the, the red room, um, the meander is at the top there. Below are all these wallpaper borders that are first cousins and second cousins of it, but none of them quite exactly the same. Um, Cole was also familiar with, with uh, patterns of this kind, not only from wallpaper, but also from English furnitures, you know, uh, furnishing fabrics specifically in the Pompeian taste, which was very popular. There was a lot of interest in the, the styles and designs that were suggested by that mysterious buried Roman city of Pompeii, you know, covered by ash, um, thanks to volcanic eruption and, and um, being excavated 
primarily beginning in the 18th century and into the 19th century. These uh, furnitures were all from, from Lancashire, where Cole was training. His knowledge of Pompeii was um, a combination of knowledge of wallpaper and fabric, and also black and white photographs. Here's a tourist photo of someone who could actually be Thomas Cole, um, leaning elusively, magically against a pillar, um, all of it in absolute black and white. Um, but in 1832, Cole had the opportunity to see Pompeii for himself and what he saw there obviously really startled, amazed, and intrigued him. Um, there's quite a difference between that and that, and uh, that. This uh, House of the Tragic Poet, which was excavated for the first time in 1824, slightly before Cole got there, was a good example of the kind of thing that Cole saw at Pompeii. It was a combination of these uh, really glowing, jewel-like colors, um, magical, kinds of um, um, uh, creatures and, and plants and animals and people, but also uh, you'll notice of uh, paintings on the walls, decorated schemes in which uh, paintings were figuring front and center. Um, the result, I think, was a, an intersection at Cedar Grove of, of the English decorative arts and the Pompeian decoration. Um, on the left, is Cole's painting chair, as and many of you know, some years ago we found pieces of the West Parlor carpet on the chair. Um, last year we were able to have the chair conserved, which meant a conservator could take it apart and the various pieces could be flattened out and photographed and we could uh, put them together. John Burroughs of J.R. Burroughs and Company and I um, worked with Rebecca Logan of Rebecca Logan Design to piece together the design. And um, on the, the right-hand side, you see a version of computer mock-up of the carpet in, in repeat. It's currently um, being produced for us and we'll be installing it um, later this spring. But what's interesting is the presence of various influences in this particular design. Um, these are Lancashire calicos with birds and brown grounds and look much, much more like uh, the carpet motif than anything that you've ever seen in the carpet. At the same time, um, the carpet also reflects Pompeii where there are many, many, many painted versions of red peacocks um, in many different houses. I've just given you three so you can see them. Uh, the design that was on Cedar Grove's floor is a pair of peacocks seated in pomegranate trees um, with some uh, very classical looking steps leading up to them. Are they the steps to the Temple of Jupiter? It could be, who knows? Uh, definitely Pompeian in feeling. And the overall effect of the room, that pale, mauvish, lavenderish color that you can see on the right hand of the simulation there, and the carpet and the frieze together, um, create an impression that is unmistakably like the kind of Pompeian interior decoration that Cole saw on his visit. Uh, these parlor as well. Um, the combination of red and green is definitely one that's much more conventional in American interiors in the early 19th century, but um, uh, the uh, ruins of Pompeii presented that kind of combination in an especially dramatic and exciting way with um, the colors themselves used to showcase the paintings on the walls. Um, Cole was sufficiently excited about what he saw there that he bought um, a copy of the first uh, colored illustrated book about Pompeii um, by John Goldicott, which appeared in 1825. And he had that copy of that book here at Cedar Grove. Um, perhaps he referred to it as he was working on these rooms. More likely, I like to think he used it perhaps as a, a tool for persuasion, you know, saying, well, you know, this is the sort of thing I have in mind, you know, <laughs> because presumably you have to tell the family something of what you're up to. You can't just spring it on them completely. 
Cole had already been thinking about incorporating art into uh, domestic interiors in 1833, am I right? I think 33. Um, he created this plan for exhibiting the, co the course of empire at Lumen Reed's home. He never actually executed this because uh, Reed wasn't willing to spring for uh, buying this many canvases, so he ended up reducing it. But he was obviously thinking and thinking hard about how to display art in the domestic uh, setting rather than necessarily um, in the gallery. In this respect, uh, he, was, he was in some ways reacting against type. These are very typical American interiors in the 1830s. And you'll notice that they have quite a bit of decoration. Um, um, attention has been lavished on carpets, on furniture, um, mirrors. Most houses had mirrors prominently displayed. Um, maps were another very popular item. Often you decorate your dining room with maps. But you'll notice that there isn't a work of art anywhere to be seen. There were some people who owned prints. There were a few people who owned paintings, but most of the paintings that people owned were portraits, um, rather than the kind of paintings that we associate with Cole. And these interiors I would call artless, not artless in the sense that they're unthought, but artless in the sense that they haven't got any. Um, <laughs> Here we have the, the diametric op opposite. This is an extremely, extremely interesting painting because it, it's an index uh, to the kind of discussion that was going on um, amongst artists in particular, but also members of the public as well, about the potential role and impact of, of art. Uh, Samuel F.B. Morse painted this uh, painting. Um, it, it's, it's really very clever. He's, He's documenting all these many, many paintings that are at the Louvre. And then, so in effect, if you buy his painting or you see his painting, you also experience those paintings. You know, it's sort of a, sort of a house of mirrors effect. Really quite fascinating. Not long after painting it, he gave up painting and went into the telegraph, but you know, it was another, another story. But uh, Cole also uh, was, was extremely interested in exposing more people uh, to art. And not just so that you can sell paintings, but so that you could actually uh, provide to people worlds and scenes and experiences that they couldn't otherwise obtain. In the same way that Morse was giving you the experience of the Louvre, even though you couldn't be there. The paintings in the Louvre were giving you the experience of other things that you couldn't otherwise um, have in your life or, or know or live through or in particular see. When Cole was in London during his first European tour, uh, it seems very likely, although I, I don't have direct documentation of this, but. Uh, there are many reasons for thinking that he visited a site there that at that time, as well as today, is called Sir John Soane's Museum. It's actually the home of Sir, of Sir John Soane, who is a, an architect and a great um, admirer of Pompeii, um, and who created his home in, or in, in, as a setting for art and artworks that he collected. I've given you a few close-ups on the right here so you can see some of the ways that those things are worked into the environment very artfully. Um, a clock that's, that's protected um, under glass, um, vases and other artifacts from classical antiquity, and uh, all of them in a sort of setting in the way that jewels are put into a setting uh, so that they could be appreciated. Uh, Cole would do something very similar in the West Parlor, in addition to the frieze that we can see up there. You can see in this later photograph some of the things that were in the room during Cole's lifetime. Um, there are, for example, at the bottom, you see there are very rare uh, vase, classical vase that he owned and brought back from Europe, uh, displayed under glass. Um, Parian vases that are uh, in imitation of classical antiquity. Uh, there were busts that were cast. 
there were all kinds of uh, items that, if not equal in value to the things that Sir John Stone's museum were intended to have the same uh, transporting effect to allow you to have the sensation of classical antiquity without actually experiencing it in person. At the same time that there were those artless interiors, there were also what I, what I call aspirational art-filled interiors, which is to say, with the exception of the picture of the young couple, most of them weren't real. They were hypothetical. So the, um, the, the etching on the left, the painting in the upper right, both of those are uh, inventions of the artists. They're not actual rooms that were built or, or existed. Um, and Cole uh, obviously was in part part of a larger cultural tide that was making landscape painting uh, highly desirable and appealing. But he was a far cry from this young couple in the front with their single landscape. Oops, let's back up. Um, at Sir John Soane's museum, he also saw what you could do with lots of art, lots of artwork. Stone had developed a system for putting paintings on um, unfolding screens, which I think is the system that Cole refers to when he talks about his plan uh, for Lumen Reed's gallery, where you could, you could actually just pack the paintings in there and, and uh, have a maximum. These are two different views of that room, so you can see a bit how it worked. But it meant that you could have a a couple of different varieties of domestic art-filled interior. You could have um, the sort of thing that, that occurred in the West Parlor, or you could, I think, this is my current theory, or you could create a little red Pompeian room off the West Parlor, and you could take the existing cabinetry <laughs> and carefully change all of the hardware so that it was very classical and looked very modern and interesting and together. And then you could exhibit paintings now. Th these are not paintings exhibited. This room is currently chock full of various kinds of material. Um, it's a store room of sorts, sort of an archives. But I think that Cole reconceived it, uh, took it to transform the pantry into something that was actually uh, a gallery for, for compactly showing a lot of art. This had other advantages as well, and I'm sure they weren't lost on his adopted family. Cole brought with him not only all this expertise that I've described, but an enormous number of works of art when everybody else was living in the artless interior, and the potential to turn them into money, all of which is very good if you're a family sort of struggling along in Catskill. While Cole was in uh, London, one of the places we know he visited was uh, the artist J.M.W. Turner's gallery. This is not a public gallery per se. It was a gallery that Turner had created adjacent to his own home. And he used it to show all kinds of works that couldn't appropriately be shown at the great salons and exhibitions. Where he, to, to which he took his large canvases. He showed watercolors here, smaller canvases, paintings that were experimental that he didn't think would uh, do well. And the whole enterprise did very, very well for him. Um, this probably isn't showing very well, but one of the things that's interesting about Turner's uh, sketchbooks is that they contain many, many, many drawings for how to present paintings on the wall, and almost all of them involve drapery, putting drapery over uh, paintings or around paintings. And that was a reflection of the close association between art exhibition and drapery. What you're seeing in the bottom um, image here is a watercolor exhibition in London um, and where the paintings are displayed against swags. Um, the drawing by Turner shows paintings under swags and of course above are our own swags, recently discovered, um, which were also above paintings. Jasper Cropsey, who visited um, Cedar Grove after Cole's death, 
was absolutely blown away by the amazing presentation of the paintings in the house. Um, and he noted in particular that the, the existing portion of the series, um, the cross on the world was displayed um, in the East Parlor, presumably underneath these swags. Um, that was in part a reflection of the fact that throughout his life at Cedar Grove, Cole continued to add to the decoration. Um, he tweaked it, he changed it, he bought new things for it. Um, here's a, a household account from 1846, not long before he died, in which, which shows the purchase of a new carpet for the East Parlor. And we now know a great deal about that carpet. Um, in the upper left is a black and white photo of it in the early 20th century. Um, on the far right is an early 1960s um, picture that includes a bit of it. And then uh, the picture in the middle, which is a, taken at a family wedding, um, Cole family wedding, um, shows the carpet still on the floor in the 1960s. And I, it's not that these women have four legs. I've blown it up a little bit for you <laughs> on the bottom so that you can see a little more of it. Um, large medallions with, with um, flowers, particularly roses, um, gold, green, red. He was still, still thinking, still plotting, still refining, still creating, still um, merging art and design. And I think that ultimately what is most exciting about these discoveries is that they really uh, offer the opportunity to experience things at Cedar Grove that, that can't be experienced anywhere else. There are many, many, many museums across America where you can see spectacular coal canvases. You know, there are archives that preserve his drawings and his writing his letters, um, but what's preserved here is, well, first of all, the foundation of his art in design. I mean, in the upper left is a portion of the frieze. You can see his brush strokes, and Margaret always says that she just paints up to Cole's brush stroke, and then she leaves a space, you know, to, to honor that it's there. So we, you actually see the foundation of the, the, what he learned in design launched him, in effect. Um, it also shows you what you can't see in any other museum, which is uh, the way that Cole thought his art should be displayed, the setting that he imagined for it. Um, there's, a, there's a level of control about it all. Um, control freakery almost, where, where every aspect of the room is really carefully curated and, and um, provided as a setting. And then the main thing is that, that I think when we're just beginning this restoration project, this will roll out the first two complete rooms, really the front uh, entry hall and the west parlor. And we'll then move on uh, to the east parlor, to the, to the red room, and to Cole's um, and Mariah's quarters upstairs, which presumably were also designed by him. Um, but even in this first stage, I think Cedar Grove offers you the opportunity to have a sort of, the sort of immersive virtual reality kind of experience of art that Thomas Cole really intended. Um, that sensation of, um, of magic, of difference, of, of exoticism, of, of another world, of, um, of being someplace that you've never been before. And I think, given Cedar Grove's power, it will be something that you, where you can't you know, be again in, another, in, in, in any other site. Um, so this has been an absolute adventure and it continues on. We motor on more discoveries every week. But this is uh, where we are to date and I think it's, it's quite a magical point. So.
Well, can I invite Jean and Matthew back up to the podium in case there are some questions? And then we invite you to join us in the back for some refreshments. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, Hello. Hello. Um, so, uh, in your uh, research, have you found anything definitive, um, one way or the other, that uh, Cole ever used uh, either of the parlors as gallery space, per se, other than just hanging on because they were pretty pictures, but really sort of the way what you would have seen in, in Turner's gallery, more or less, or, Something to that. Um, um, I think the answer is yes and no. <laughs> um, the yes is there is that wonderful reference where, where Cole says to his sister-in-law, um, we're expecting a visitor um, who wants to see the paintings in the studio and uh, in the house and, and please show them to him and put them in the best possible light, which certainly suggests that kind of exhibition. Um, there are definitely people who bought paintings from Cole who came here. One of the areas of research that we haven't delved into, this is the no part, is uh, that we don't know nearly enough about exactly who came here and under what auspices. But, but do you think that there was the, the possibility that they sold directly to clients coming to see the work? It's, it's hard to say. I, you know, we have no evidence that that occurred. Um, that's not to say there is no evidence out there to discover, but it's not, it's not what we have. It's more likely, um, I don't, you know, it's, it, it's hard to say. It, it, would be, it would be speculative. I think the intention was definitely to create an impression. It was definitely to, um, there was career advancement involved, you know, there, uh, that kind of thing. Whether it was actually a case of, you know, money changes hands and we take it off the wall, uh, you know, that I don't know. But of course, if you wanted to commission Cole to paint something, would you not wish to come and see a bit of an array of what, you, you know, might be possible? So I think that that putting things in the best light really suggests that. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. I wonder if he displayed only his own work, or did he uh, display paintings by other artists as well? Paintings by other artists as well, including his sister. That at the point when the auction sale took place in the uh, 1960s, there were 34 works by Cole hanging on the walls of the house, but there were uh, numerous works by other people as well. Yes. Oh, well, the, the west parlor, the ceiling was replaced, so we're not sure about that yeah. one. But in the east parlor, there wasn't any indication of decoration on the ceiling. So uh, it was simply a um, distemper, I believe, white distemper was up there. I think it had probably more to do with cheapness <clears throat> and also <laughs> with, with cleanliness. You know, there's a huge problem with insects, especially flies. So a lot of you know areas of color were were recoded, and you could whitewash your ceiling, you know, pretty effectively. There are colored ceilings in um, antiquity, and there are colored ce colored ceilings in America in the 19th century. But uh, all we know about these is we know of two of them, and th those two were white. Yes. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Jay. How long? You, how long would it have taken to do this work? Mm, that's a very good question. I, months and months. I, it, it, he, it would have had to have taken that long because there's just so much hand work that is going on. And you'd also have to let, it's all painted very thinly, as you can see yeah. there. It's very thin, but you would still have a drying period before you put the next oil? layer on. Oil. Yeah, it's all, it's linseed oil paint. The only, 
the only non-linseed oil was the hull, right? That we know so, so far. far. So yes. far. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, one of the things when Jean mentioned Pompeii, uh, I did some trench exposures, very narrow exposures up and down the walls to see if there were paneling designs or painted chair rail or something going on at the baseboard, and we found no other evidence for it. Yeah, it kind of came up empty. And in a way, it makes sense. I mean, Cropsey's comment about the cross in the world uh, canvas as being in the East Parlor really suggests that he, you know, he was changing things around, that some things were put in there um, uh, with the intention of having them always remain there, but some things kind of came and went. And uh, a lot of additional wall decoration would have made that more complicated because you'd have to plan for certain, I mean, he did paint to set sizes, but you would have to really somehow calculate that so that you would be able to work the painting you know, into the wall decoration. So it looks, it looks like it was solid. Yeah, Paul. Can you go through the, summarize the decision process that led you to be confident that you were looking at Cole's work up there and not something like his nephew, Rick McConkey, who worked with him as an architect and that it was actually his handiwork and not just necessarily his designs that some other talented technician was putting on the wall. Well, now are we talking about are we talking about the execution or about the color? Execution. Yeah, the execution. The execution. Uh, you can. You want to take that? I have. I have some thoughts about that. I I, I don't think we can say definitively, say right? That. So it's. But there is. It, well, it's possible that he had help in doing sure. it. Sure. Yeah, that is possible. It's also. Um, there's a very high degree of skill and dexterity in it. And one part of Cole's career that I didn't go into because we were very pressed for time is he had an extended period of his life where he worked as a decorative painter, painting, painting objects. Um, and he also uh, worked with Lumen Reed to figure out a scheme for Lumen Reed's gallery where he and other artists would paint panels of doors and so forth, and the the um, the dexterity of the painting is such that it really suggests someone who has a decorative painting background. Um, certainly, there were other people who who did that, but the combination of the sort of relatively arcane knowledge that's evident with the dexterity really kind of suggests that, that that's who it was. When when Matthew started uncovering this, we we thought initially it must be stenciled. Because it's, it must be stenciled, because it's very precise. But Margaret um, was able to you know, clarify for us that there were some stenciled elements, but by and large, it was freehand, which is. You mentioned that there's no payment to any other decorative painter. That is true, yes. That is absolutely true. Yeah, there, we, we have a lot of records of things that were done to the house and on the house. And typically what would happen is the, that the, um, the materials would be purchased and then a painter would be part of the deal. So you, you, know, you get the sort of the package. And we don't have any evidence of anybody decorative being hired. Yeah. Back in the back by the wall? Yes, one of the there are, there are a number of there there's much much good news about about Cedar Grove, but there are a number of tragedies about it, and one of them is that the work that was done in order to open it initially or sort of preserve the house was extremely aggressive, and uh, in ordinary circumstances we would be able to go back and map where where uh, nails had been driven into the wall and where things had been hung, and that was not possible to do because there was so much. Um, stuff, you know, that was done. Um, 
So uh, that we don't know. There are some, there are mentions of paintings hanging. Uh, it, it is potentially possible to develop a, 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 a mapping system from other information that would suggest where things were. But unfortunately, that physical evidence is lost. The same thing is true of uh, hardware marks on, on um, moldings and things like that. There was a lot of scrubbing that went on. Um, I know, let's see, where is that little, little device for the remote? Ah, uh, here. Ah, um, yes, there is. How did I know someone would ask that? Well, we <laughs> End of talk. <laughs> Uh, this was, this was, uh, there was some evidence that earlier in the 40s, Cole may have actually um, painted a floor cloth for the hall. Um, he had an additional, see this is the nightmare of the 25 minute talk. He, he also had a, a, a phase of his life where he and his father owned and operated a floor cloth factory for which he provided the designs and for which he assisted with the printing. So he had the capacity to do that. We have a receipt that shows purchase of materials that suggest a floor cloth um, earlier in the 40s. But recently, um, I, was, uh, I got access to some coal records that I hadn't had before. And in them, I found this notation. He obviously, in, in 46, purchased a floor cloth, uh, quite an expensive one, um, and uh, during a time when he was in New York. So the, we are reproducing um, a floor cloth for the hall, and it actually has been done and, and will now be installed, and it is based on certain assumptions about the, the value that's recorded in this notation. Boy, am I glad I stuck that in. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a style question that probably doesn't have a clear answer, but uh, the, uh, the freeze of the creator of the, uh, the mm -hmm. parlor, uh, to me it looks like it uh, has two very different influences, the Pompeian Greco Roman key and then uh, the very romantic looking swags with the knotted fringe and all of that. So I guess I'm wondering if what you think might have been his, his point of view? Was he trying to marry two styles, or were they done at two different times? I'm so glad you asked that. I have a slide that um, speaks directly to that. Um, these are, are painted swags at Pompeii. There's a lot of swaggery at Pompeii of, of different sorts. Uh, swags of this, swags of that. Uh, that's certainly an, an influence, but uh, is, is it a melding? Yes, I think it, I think it is. I think it's uh, pulling together, you know, that classical antiquity in the form of that meander at the top, you know, with, with the, the elegant drapery that's associated with art. And I think um, one of the things that I'm sure you've drawn from all of this already is that there was a strong association in the public imagination um, between Pompeii specifically, and art. Um, there, people were showing art against red walls before Pompeii was discovered, but it's certainly, the discoveries there certainly fueled that. So I think it's a mixture. There's no knotted fringe in Pompeii, as far as I know. Although, although perhaps I have not dug deep enough. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think those things are are, are definitely melded there. I mean, it's kind of, um, you know, it's kind of Pompeii on the Hudson, you know, that kind of, <laughs> that kind of notion. Yeah, Jay. Is the carpet that's being reproduced with a peacock medallion, did he design that, or is that one for a side purchase? I, I am thinking that he did. I haven't, I don't, I don't yet, I mean, there's no absolute smoking gun, you know, but there, there, there's so much evidence that points that way. Um, actually, I can show you. This is actually a sample um, of the 
of the carpet. Um, there are a number of things that suggest that he might have done that. Um, and some of them are quite concrete. The, the, the pieces of carpet that were found on the chair were complete widths. Uh, some of you may know that the way these carpets were woven was not as broad loom. They were woven typically in 27 inch wide strips and then the strips were sewn together and the whole blanket was stretched out and, and tacked from wall to wall. But the strips of this carpet are like 21 inches wide. So it clearly isn't standard British carpet mill issue. It's not, not coming from you know, the great center of carpet weaving in the Midlands of the UK. It's coming from a domestic producer. And those domestic producers, there were not a lot of mills weaving Brussels by the time Cole was doing his decorating, but there were some. In fact, um, when going into this, I had always been told, the literature had always said that there wasn't any domestic carpet uh, weaving industry of, of, of Brussels carpet. But in the course of doing the research for this project, I discovered absolutely incontrovertible evidence that Americans were weaving Brussels carpet. And those mills had representatives in New York City. Cole was credited with the purchase of this carpet when he returned from many months in New York. In other words, it would have been so very easy, you know, to go to the, the representative's showroom and say, you know, I'm, a, I'm an industrial designer. I've got a design here. Uh, can we get this woven before I leave for Catskill? So I, I think um, then the other things which are more sort of anecdotal anecdotal in a way or, or atmospheric I think are very convincing too. The, the strange relationship between the carpet design and those bird printed cottons. I mean the carpet, the carpet design kind of doesn't look like a carpet, it kind of looks like a fabric. And that, you know, it, it just, one can't help but be very suspicious. And then of course there's the fact that he seems to have liked to control every detail. So, you know, not. Yes. Um, among the archives of Cole, have you ever found any of my kids of some of the he fancied himself an architect and an overall conceptual uh, artist? Have we ever found any of these small studies or things of this sort? The commissions that he had to do with? No, uh, but boy, I sure did look. I, I really did. I, I thought probably my best bet was the Detroit Institute of Arts uh, collection, um, but that came up empty. Uh, there's certainly evidence of continuing interest in decoration in the form of the, you know, the Lumen Reed Gallery and those panels, his panels, survive at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. Um, he did all those drawings for a house of his own that was going to be built here. Uh, and that was all very Italianate, and this design was all very Italian influenced. So um, I think the probability is there, but the actual physical evidence, it, it hasn't come to light today, let's put it that way. Now, could something like this be in a collection and someone not know what it is? Absolutely. Yes, that would be totally possible. Yeah. Do you think that Alana um, perhaps shows uh, what Cole might have, have had in mind in the 1870s? Would the church have been influenced by Cole's design of this house? Yeah, I mean, not so much the Moorish and all that, but the way that the paintings are hung in that house was so yeah. specific and still a little bit cool. Um, I think so. I think the, uh, particularly the idea of the painted wall. You know, I, and I, it's very strange for me. I feel like I've got, come around full circle because I started my career doing research on church, you know, and doing research on him, his, his work at Alana. And, and now I feel like I've sort of come around full circle and we're back to well, what gave him the idea in the first place. And he was certainly spending time in this interior 
And I think as we get it more complete and, and people can feel, can feel the magic, you know, first of all, I mean, I do think you should expect to be somewhat shocked. I think it will be startling by comparison with what was there. But it, it's also visually very, very captivating. And I, and I think a church was very sensitive, you know, to things like that. So the idea of painting your house, probably, yes, I would think. Anyone else? Okay. Bye -bye.